Uh, let us bow our heads in prayer. Let's pray. What an honor it is, dear Father in heaven, to have you as our Heavenly Father. As we go through your words this morning, may you please open our hearts that we may be transformed in likeness of you. This we pray, in Christ we pray. Amen. All right. So, since today is the Father's Day, it is just timely for me to speak about the Father. Well, it, I may not be the best person to, pick, to speak about this because I'm not the Father myself, but we will be uh, getting words from a reliable source, which is the Bible. So, I believe this is also an important topic since in today's society, manhood is currently being attacked. Well, if not attacked, it is being redefined. Turn up your social media and you can see fathers uh, being portrayed as immature boys. Well, this morning, we would like to, I would like to share with you some important points or actions that a father does on how he is to be a good father. So before that, I would like to show you some alarming statistics on about uh, homes of the fatherless families. All right. So on the year 2021, the count of single parent families here on Australia, in, in Australia breached um, the million count. So imagine that. And four out of five of those family, the single parent is a mother. So about 750,000 families with only single mother bringing up or rearing up that family. So one effect of this one is fatherlessness increases poverty. Well, in Australia, a recent study of 500 divorces with children five to eight years after separation found four in five of the divorced mothers were dependent on social security. Well, it, it might not be directly uh, seen at first, but uh, continuing reading this one, Monash University Center of Population and Urban Research show that family breakup rather than unemployment is the main rise, cause of the rise of poverty levels in Australia. So, uh, we tend to look at poverty uh, at unemployment, unemployment being the cause of poverty. But when they did the research, it was the breakup in the family that caused the poverty. So, pretty alarming, right? Another thing, fatherlessness lowers educational performance. So, this one is pretty interesting. They did a study on three different kinds of families. One is for heterosex heterosexual married couples. Another one is for cohabiting heterosexual couples. And the other one is homosexual couples. Now, the children in their educational endeavors, uh, out of all these three types of families, the one who performed the most well is the children of those who are in uh, a family with married heterosexual couples. So, the conclusion of this study was that married couples seem to offer the best environment for a child's social and educational development. So, uh, aside from this one, we can have uh, more statistics on being fatherless. We'll not dig into these details, but here are they. Fatherlessness increases crime. Fatherlessness increases drug abuse. Fatherlessness increases sexual problems. Fatherlessness increases physical and mental health problems. Now, this is really pretty uh, alarming for us. Now, bringing all these numbers up doesn't mean to diminish or bring down the roles of a woman. No, we're not talking about like that. Uh, instead, what we're talking about is um, God's intention of a woman and of man to play each of their role. 
And when these roles are done independently by a man or woman, it will be very hard. So, uh, if you are a single parent right now, well, these numbers are not meant to dishearten you. And I believe uh, there is an exemption to all these numbers. And by following God, I know that there is a special providence for you. So, uh, also bring up these numbers doesn't mean that men should think highly of themselves. No, we must uh, proceed with our study with humbleness in our hearts and dependence on God. Because the fact of the matter is that you can be a male and not be a man. You can have the ability to produce offsprings, be called a biological father, and not be a father per se. So, this morning, I would like to share with you three action words that a father does. So, let's proceed. First point I would like to share with you is a father disciples. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses nine, 4 to 9, we can read here the summary of God's commandments, which is loving Him. And then, aside from those commandments, it was tasked to the parents to teach these commandments to the children. So as parents, we are tasked to disciple our children. So what is a disciple? Uh, plainly speaking, disciple is the one who lives like Christ and at the same time, bringing others to Christ. And in this verse, we can see that God commands His people to love Him with all their heart and aside from that, to have these teachings taught to their children. So, as disciples, we are to live like Christ and we are to bring others to that way of living. And the very first mission of fathers is their family. We should not like go away and look further. It's just right in front of you. So your first mission field should be your family. So one mistake that we can commit when raising our children spiritually is relying on the church for the child's spiritual growth. I believe it is mainly in the family where the child should experience spiritual growth. And the church is just a supplement to that experience. So, fathers have this huge role to bring up their child to grow into being disciples of Christ. Well, as human beings, we are naturally selfish. But I believe when the father held his firstborn, all the feelings uh, were, I'm pretty sure, selfless in a sense. So there should be this transformative uh, moment when you bear your child. And one of the stories that we can look at the Bible for this transform transformative experience is the story of Enoch. So, when Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after the birth of Methuselah, 300 years, and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, then he was no more because God took him. Now, it is interesting to see here that the Bible took note of the timestamp when Enoch started his walk with God. And it was during the birth of his son, Methuselah. So, like Enoch, I hope we had this experience to strive to be better, to be better for our children, and to be disciple as well as disciplers for our family.
All right. Up to our, up to our next point. A father addresses needs. Found in 1 Timothy 5 verse 8, it says, But if any provide that not for his own, and especially his own household, he hath denied the faith, and is worse than unbeliever. Look at the, uh, like, intense uh, diction give, given to those who do not provide for their household. He who does not provide is worse than an unbeliever. Well, if there is a story of a father who provides, uh, it will be the story of the prodigal son, right? Imagine giving out your inheritance while you still live, providing the inheritance to your child while you are still alive. And that story just goes to show that the, fa the father's unconditional love, a love that is willing to provide even though at times we are disobedient. Well, uh, one of my experience being a pastor's kid is that as a family, we... Uh, we go together with our father to his appointments. So, we used to ride in this two-door sports car. Well, don't think of it as a flashy car. It's none, none like that at all. It is maybe like a 35-year-old sports car. Very old and very unreliable. And... Maybe bring it here will be considered as not worthy to be in the road. <laughs> so I just want you to imagine seven people getting up to that car, a two-door car. Imagine that, where you have to bend the chairs and all of us children will have to step in and get to the car. Imagine seven people getting in the car. And you know those news? Uh, like people illegally crossing borders where the car is all stuffed up with so many people. Well, that's how we felt like when we used to, <laughs> when we used to visit our provinces to go to other churches. And when all of us seven people get out of that car, people were like looking at us, man, these guys be trafficking people. <laughs> so, so that was really a fun experience during the time. And my father wanting to provide more or a better uh, riding experience planned to get a bigger vehicle. So, but without the financial capacity to purchase a bigger vehicle, he went to a good friend of his to ask for some assistance. And so with all the hesitations he had, he still went to this to his good friend and asked, uh, "Hey, would you be able to help me buy a car?" Now, the reaction of his friend was just that her eyes grew big, and my father was like, "Ah, I should have given into my hesitations. This is not a good idea after all." Well, his friend asked him. Uh, how much would that car be? And my father responded with the amount. And her action was, her eyes got bigger. Now, my father was like, no, this is really a terrible idea. And this is what she said. Is that a car? My phone is more expensive than that. <laughs> Does that thing even run? Now, <laughs> long story short, my father went to get that car. And he did not went into any dealer. He went into a junk shop. <laughs> All right. And he did not drive out the car. They have to use crowbars and shovels to dig out the wheels of, the car, of that car of who knows how long it has been there. And so my father brought home that car very happy that he can provide 
a bigger vehicle for his family. But you know, us seeing that car, it was very terrible. You know what's the color of the car? Its color is rust. <laughs> Literal rust, not like golden orange of some sort. It was all covered in rust, and the rust was eating up its chassis, and it has uncountable number of holes that we didn't even bother to count. So we would even prefer to stuff ourselves up again and ride the human trafficking car <laughs> than riding up to this uh, new, bigger vehicle, which has many holes. Well, uh, one day, uh, we that time we used to go to the academy and we stay in the dormitory. And when my father is like offering a ride to drop us off to the dorm, we would rather take out a portion of, a, of our small allowance just to do a public ride so that we will not be dropped off with this terrible car. <laughs> so, but one day, my father, with all his authority, went to us and said, you know, today I will drop you to school. And with the sound of his voice, uh, we are pretty sure that we cannot do anything to bend what he said. So we got up and packed our things. And, well, it's nice thing that he did a compromise. He dropped us off to school during the night. So that there were fewer people, and if ever there are some, they will not be able to see the condition of the car. <laughs> and one of my father's friend used to tease him, Hey, you've got this car. It's an L300, right? Uh, my father responded to him, No, this is not an L300. This is called Toyota. Tamarau FX. Then his friend insisted, no, that is an L300. Then my father said, no, this is Toyota Tamarau. Then his friend said, well, look, this car has 300 holes. <laughs> and my father said, well, 300 holes, what does the L step for? Well, with this number of holes, this car definitely leaks. So this is your car. Leaking 300 holes. <laughs> so, looking back, uh, I was, let's say, uh, like, shy of getting into that car. But looking at it right now, I see it as a core memory of a father striving to provide for his children. All right. So, Up to our last point. A father disciplines. Found in Proverbs 13, verse 24, it says, Whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. Well, this is a pretty controversial verse that is used by disciplinarian parents who like to raise a hand to their children. But I believe that way or method of raising up children or disciplining children is not very effective, especially during these times. And without digging further into that issue, I got the stand of the Seventh-day Adventist on this particular issue. Ellen White urged great parental restraint in the matter of physical correction. She placed numerous conditions around it. Such correction was to be the last resort after milder measures of correction had been exhausted. This was to be done in love after a period of prayer by the parent and when the parent was free from anger. Afterward, there was to be a period of restoration and joint prayer with the child. Even then, her estimate was frequently one such correction will be enough for a lifetime. 
So even Ellen White is pretty much uh, against, I would say, to this way of uh, raising up children. And that it is just the last resort when there is no other way. And she said that maybe once is enough for a lifetime. So maybe when you get the chance, put it all in. <laughs> anyway. Maybe what will be effective during this time is uh, instead of raising up our hands, is to give out words of wisdom and counsels. So, one of the big impacting counsels in the Bible was the counsel given to Moses by his father, or technically his father-in-law, who was Jethro. So, in the times of the Israelites, the Israelites started out with just Moses being the sole leader of the Israelites. So all the decisions from the smallest disputes to the big decisions for the whole Israelites have to go through him. Imagine all the stress and all the time it consumes for Moses just to uh, take on all those issues. So, his father-in-law, seeing this situation, went up to Moses and gave him some advice and counsel. So, what Jethro said to Moses is that you are doing a very bad thing. You should delegate some people to decide over a certain period a certain number of people to, to them to decide for themselves and take that responsibility away from you. So, this is uh, like our form of government right nowadays where we have people spanning over a big group of people then getting out and shrinking down to a lesser number of people. This was really a good advice of Jethro, to his son-in-law, Moses. So, he said that let them be judged at all times. Every great matter they see shall bring to you. So, only the important ones were brought up to Moses. In that way, Moses was able to make more time for more important decisions for the Israelites. Well, just like Jethro, I believe every father here has a good advice or counsel to their children in which their child can use. God's leading and guidance are mediated by you. So, I have this Mandela effect of like the command of getting judges was directly given from God, but it was mediated through Jethro. And just like that, I believe God's guidance and counseling to the children are being mediated through the Father. So, you are the medium through which God, God's guidance is delivered to your child. Well, Talking about councils, uh, my story of coming here to Australia was just all out on a whim. Uh, back in the Philippines, I was working on a corporate job and spending some time there, got bored and decided to seek uh, better opportunities abroad, which is what they said. And without planning much, and thinking about it, I just decided to apply. What I was just thinking at the time was to get the cheapest place I can stay in, get whatever job I can work that can support my bills and studies for tuition, and that's it. Honestly, back then I wasn't even thinking of 
what church will I go to? And, you know, looking back, uh, telling this decision to my parents made them really concerned. So, my father was like, well, son, you have to get there and find you a good community. That was his advice. Find good people out there to guide you because you don't know anyone there. And when hard times comes, we will not be able to support you. So, with those advice, he did not just said that to me. He even went here. And maybe some of you met him a couple of months ago. So he even went here and find that community for me. And fortunately enough, Frankston Church was uh, accepting of me. And uh, I would like to thank you for that. Amen, amen. <laughs> so, uh, looking back then, uh, the negative effects of my uh, the abrupt decisions, well, have been averted uh, by uh, certain families here who adopted me. So special thanks to the Castillo and uh, Mercado family. And honestly, now looking back, had my original plan of coming here just out of a whim, I could not imagine what church will I be attending today. Or what church, or even if I will be in a church today. Maybe with my attitude, I will just be sitting right there at the very back. And without people knowing that I could play a or two. So, I'm really blessed, really more than blessed to be accepted here. Now, fathers, all of you have this uh, responsibility of counseling your child, starting when they're born and even throughout all their lifetime. Now, these are the three points that I raised earlier. And with that, I would like to describe the father as a dad. So, father, dad. A father disciples. A father lives like Christ and brings his children to live the same life. A father addresses needs. A father is a selfless man who will do everything to provide for the needs of his family. And a father disciplines. A father is full of wisdom that he can use all of that to impart to his children. And now, I would like, in conclusion, I would like to get back to our uh, memory text, which is found in Deuteronomy 1, verse 31. There you saw how the Lord your God carried you, as a father carries his son, all the way you went until you reached this place. So, let us not forget that we even have a better model, or the best model, which is our Heavenly Father. And we should always remember how God has led us in the past, and use those experiences to, for us to reach an even better place. So with that, I would like to once again greet everyone. Happy Father's Day, Happy Sabbath, and may God bless us all. Amen. Our dear Father in heaven, we would like to thank you for what we have just heard today. May each every day of our lives be more on the transformation of growing to be more like you. And may your guidance be with us every day. Counsel of the Holy Spirit and the love of Jesus Christ be with us all, now and forever. Amen.